Good morning, and welcome to the truck stop service at the TA in Wilcox, Arizona. Hello. I'm Mike Smithers from Extended Hands Ministries here in Wilcox. And um, let's start by being thankful. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to get together with not only those of us who are here in person, but those of us who are going to join us online at a later date. We thank you for the opportunity to uh, get into your word and to learn a little bit more every day about what you have in store for us. So this morning I thought we'd talk a little bit about temptation. Uh, what is temptation? Where does it come from? How do we deal with it? How is it dealt with scripturally? Uh, you know, James chapter 1, starting at verse 2, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And James continues in verse 12. He says, Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. So that kind of sounds like temptation is good, right? You know, temptation helps you with patience. It helps you be perfect. It helps you receive the crown of life. So, temptation must be good? Well, no. Wrong. <coughs> temptation is bad. God can use it when we do go through it to help us, to help us grow, to help us become more complete uh, Christians. But the temptation itself is bad, and I'll show you why. Matthew 4, 3 is talking about uh, Jesus going off into the desert for 40 days of fasting. And at the end, he gets tempted he says, and when the tempter came to him, that's talking about Satan. Satan is the tempter, not God. Jesus mentioned in the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, 13, he asked God, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And some translations say deliver us from the evil one. So Jesus is telling us to ask God not to lead us into temptation. And John 16, 24, Jesus says, Ask and you shall receive. So if you ask God to lead you not into temptation, he will. You can avoid temptation. And also, James writes in chapter 1, verse 13, he says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and neither tempts he any man. So temptation comes from Satan. He is the tempter, not God. You know, as you go through Scripture, the, the books we call the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of them talk about so often the scribes and Pharisees tempted Jesus. Now, I'm not going to go into each in, in detail, but you can look at uh, Matthew 16, verse 1, Matthew 19, 3, Matthew 22, 18, Matthew... 22:35, and it says the same things in Mark, Luke, and John. I recommend that if you really want to study the guy, the the Gospels, there's a book called uh, Life for Today Gospel Edition by Andrew Womack. It's awesome. It shows all four Gospels on the same page, so you can compare them. Each one is important. Each one, as we were talking earlier, there's different perspectives that we need to know. If you look at all these temptations, they were from the scribes and the Pharisees. They weren't from God. Jesus was tempted, and he dealt with it perfectly each and every time. Uh, Matthew 16, or 26, 41, <coughs> Jesus is, last night with his disciples, he tells them, Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So temptation comes because our flesh is weak. In the spirit, we are totally immune from temptation. But in the flesh, we're weak. And temptation will come. Um, in the parable of the sower, which I prefer to call the parable of the seed. The parable is not about the sower. It's about the seed. In fact, it's about the ground that the seed falls on. <clears throat> but in Luke chapter 8, verse 13... Jesus said, They on the rock are they which, when they hear, 
receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation, fall away. Mm -hmm. Temptation will cause you, if you fall into it, if you succumb to temptation, temptation will cause you to fall away from the Lord. It will tempt you, temptation will cause you to fall away from the word. If you have no root in yourself, temptation will tear you away from God. So no, temptation is not good. Let's put the fi final nail in that coffin. God does not tempt us, Satan does. God is the one who enables us to beat temptation. And you will be tempted. Jesus said in John 16, 33, in the world you shall have tribulation. Now, if you don't think temptation is tribulation, maybe you're enjoying your temptations too much. Temptation is horrible. If you're going through temptation, it is certainly tribulation. So Jesus said in the world, you shall have tribulation or temptation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So you can survive temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, there has no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. And in 2 Peter 2, verse 9, it says, The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. He knows how to deliver us from it. So you shouldn't have to succumb to it. In Revelation 3.10, it says, Because you have kept the word of my patience, I also will keep you from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So temptation comes on everyone. But Jesus said he will keep us from it. So if God won't let us be tempted beyond what we can handle and gives us a way out, why is temptation a problem? Well, like everything God gives us, the solution to the problem of temptation is given by grace and must be accepted through faith. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. So like healing, like salvation, deliverance, it's all given freely by grace. But we have to pick it up. We have to claim God's grace through faith. You have to recognize temptation to be able to resist it. How does temptation come? Well, temptation is anything that lures you away from God, anything that causes you to take your eyes off our Lord. Listen to what John has to say. 1 John 2:16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. So all these things are of the world, and they try to pull you away from the Father. Anything that is not of the Father is of the world, and is therefore temptation. Think about that. Anything that is not from God is temptation. John places all that is in the world into three categories. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I maintain that every temptation can be placed into one or more of these categories. And furthermore, anything that can be placed into these categories is temptation. Remember, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, There has no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. So let's look at some, some temptations that others have faced and see how they fit into these three categories. Genesis chapter 3 is really the first temptation, the temptation of Eve. Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to, be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her. And he did eat. The tree was good for food. That's the lust of the flesh. Hunger is perhaps the most powerful lust of the flesh. 
If you've ever been without food for an extended period of time, you know how powerful that temptation is. All you want to do when you're starving is eat. It takes priority over everything else. Then it says she saw that the tree was pleasant to the eyes. That's the lust of the eyes. The tree was desired to make one wise. That's the pride of life. Perhaps the, the strongest temptation of all. The fall of Adam, the fall of mankind, was critical to Satan's plan to take over the world. So he used all three categories of temptation. He left nothing to chance. The, pride, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. He used all three temptations to overpower Eve, to deceive her. Now perhaps the second most critical temptation in Satan's plan was the temptation of our Lord Jesus. Jesus was the solution God provided to the fall of mankind. He succeeded in getting Adam and Eve to fall victim to temptation. Jesus was the solution to that to bring mankind back to the Lord. If Satan could stop that from happening, he won. I like to say all Satan had to do to defeat Jesus was ignore him. You know, think about it. If he just ignored him and told the Pharisees and the scribes and everybody else just ignore Jesus, he never would have been crucified. But God knew he was incapable of ignoring Jesus. Jesus was such a threat to Satan's plan. There's no way he could. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Yes, Jesus was tempted in all points, just like we are. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Let's go through that. Jesus is the solution to our problems because he experienced them and overcame them. If there was anything Jesus did not go through, we'd still be stuck with it. He had to suffer everything that we suffer in this world and overcome it to be, for us to be able to overcome it. So let's examine his temptations. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, it says, When the tempter came to him, he said, If you be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Just as with Eve, the temptation of the lust of the flesh the greatest of which is hunger. And Matthew, Matthew wrote in verse 2, And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Okay, I fasted for a week at times. He fasted for 40 days. So I know he was hungry. <laughs> so the first thing temp Satan tempted him with was food. The next temptation in verse 5, Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. This is the temptation of the pride of life. Satan was saying, You are God incarnate. This temple is yours. The angels are yours to command. Prove it. Show your power. Show your might. You know, we fall victim to that all the time. I'm a child of God. Nothing can harm me. I can do anything, which is true. But you can't focus on what you can do. You have to focus on what Jesus has done. You have to remove the pride of life from you. Finally, in verse 8, it says, Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. This is both the temptation of the lust of the eyes. He showed him all the wonders of the world and all their glory. That's amazing. You know, as corrupt as this world is, it's still an amazing place. It is so beautiful. Mankind and Satan in working together cannot totally corrupt this world. It is still glorious and beautiful. It's also the pride of life. He says, I will give this to you. So as with the temptation of Eve, Satan left nothing to chance. He used each of the categories of temptation. Unlike Eve, though, Jesus beat these temptations. How did he do it? 
Well, when we understand how he did, he did it, we can use his example to defeat temptation when it besets us. In each case, Jesus went to God's word. It is written. Three times he was tempted. Three times he said, it is written. And he quoted scripture. That's how we beat temptation. That's how we beat Satan. <clears throat> you know, if Eve had gone to God's word, she could have beaten temptation. But she only had a secondhand version of the word. You got to remember, it says God told Adam, do not eat from the tree in the middle of the garden. Eve got it through Adam. She should still have known it. She should still have believed it. But I'll tell you, this is why we must get into God's word ourselves. Preachers and teachers are essential in teaching us about God and his word. But they are not a substitute for a first-hand intimate knowledge of God. Like I said, Eve had a second-hand knowledge and she fell victim to deception. She fell victim to temptation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Remember 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Excuse me. <clears throat> now we know that we will have to face temptation. We know that temptation is not good. Although God can help us use it for our benefit. When we fall into temptation, if we listen to God and stick with him, we can grow. We can become better people. But the temptation, that's not the purpose of the temptation. In Romans 8, 28, it says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So if you love God, if you are the called and you understand his purpose, then you can grow because of the fact that you face temptation. But we know it's Satan who tempts and God who sees us through it. While we know that we know that while he realizes we will be faced with temptation, he wants us to avoid it and will help us in our struggle. We know that temptation comes in three forms, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. We know that the word is our primary defense against temptation and our personal intimate familiarity with the word is essential. Again, we don't want a secondhand or just a secondhand knowledge of the word. We don't want a secondhand knowledge of God. We want our own personal revelation of the love of God. So let's look briefly at each form of temptation to get a more specific way to combat it. The lust of the eyes. Psalm 101.3 says, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. So what does that tell you? To avoid the lust of the eyes, don't look at things that tempt you. Keep your focus on our Lord. I can't tell you everything. I can't go through everything the Bible says about this. But you, as I said, you need your own personal revelation. So do a word search sometime and study the words, turn aside. See how often we are admonished, admonished not to turn aside from the Lord. Remember, temptation is anything that draws you away from the Lord. So do not turn aside from the word. Do not turn aside from the Lord our God. <clears throat> the lust of the flesh, the second temptation. Yes, sexual lust is often the most talked about or avoided in conversation. Lust of the flesh. The first nine chapters of Proverbs contrast wisdom with the harlot, which is symbolic of all lustly flesh. Learn these chapters and live them. Study the first nine chapters of Proverbs is awesome. Wisdom is what we want to stay focused on. The lust of the flesh is what we want to not stay focused on. And it's beautiful how we set it up. He contrasts wisdom with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the world. So learn those chapters, study them, and learn to live them. Now, one of the greatest ways to defeat the lust of the flesh is through prayer and fasting. As we've seen, hunger is the most powerful fleshly lust. It's not sexual lust, although that's powerful. 
But you know, you can survive without that. You cannot survive without food. And your body knows that. Your body will tell you, hey, it's time to eat. I don't care what you're doing. Sit down and eat. By training our bodies to obey our mind when we set out to fast, we train our body to obey our mind in every way. Think about that. The most powerful weapon your body has against your mind is hunger. Your body will try to run your life through hunger and other lusts. So you need to train your body to submit to your mind. Body says, I'm hungry. Your mind says, we're fasting. Suck it up. And that's what Jesus was talking about in Matthew chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. That's when Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfiguration. His disciples had tried to cast the demon out of the so-called epileptic boy. And they couldn't do it. I, I could spend an hour just talking about that episode there. But Jesus told them, they said, why couldn't we cast this demon out? He says, because of your unbelief. <clears throat> now I know some translations say because of your little faith. But that's not true. Unbelief is not little faith. These disciples had faith. For a couple of years, they had been going around raising the dead, casting out demons. Jesus gave them power over all demons. And they had been succeeding. They were full of faith. Their faith was exercised and it was powerful. But when they went to cast this demon out, it threw that boy into spasms. It threw him on the ground. It kicked him around. And their senses, their physical senses, told them that they didn't succeed. They did. The demon had to leave. He told him to leave. They told him to leave. He had to. But as he was leaving, he, he threw this boy all over the place in what people call an epileptic fit. So their senses caused them to disbelieve what God had told them. That is unbelief. So that's why fasting and prayer, Jesus said, this type this type of unbelief, not this type of demon, this type of unbelief is only defeated by fasting and prayer. Again, when we fast, we train our bodies to obey our minds, not to rule over us. Now, keep this in mind. If you are fasting without spending your time in prayer, studying God's word, word you're just starving yourself. And any unbeliever can do that. They can fast in that way. There are fasts all over the internet. Um, you know, you can learn to do this. You can learn you lose weight. Unbelievers fast all the time. But it doesn't do them any good spiritually because they're not spending their time in prayer. The point is to train your body to listen to the word and not to its own senses. <clears throat> so when you're fasting, make sure you're spending time in the word and praying. Lastly, the temptation of the pride of life. Do a word search sometime and study on the word humble. I'm not going to get into a lot of teaching today because of time constraints on humbling yourself. Remember, God doesn't humble you. If God was to humble you, that would be humiliation, not being humble. You humble yourself. You cannot be prideful and humble at the same time. You cannot operate in the pride of life when you're being humble. So go ahead and get your own revelation. Do a word search on the word humble and learn what it means to be humble. Even so, you have to own the word. That's why you need to take the time and study it. Now, one final caution. Galatians 6.1 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. All fault is a result of temptation. Anytime you sin, anytime you fall away from the word, anytime you fall away from the Lord, it's because you succumb to temptation. That's Satan's goal, to turn you away from the Lord. So if you find a brother or sister in sin, in a fault, succumbing to temptation, restore him. It says restore him or her, not condemn or convict. It's the spirit who convicts. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. 
If God is not condemning people, we have no right to do so. So remember, restore them. Bring them back to the word in meekness, not in arrogance. It's arrogant to condemn somebody for sinning. Because you know something? When you point one finger at somebody, you've got three fingers pointing right back at you. And I have found in experience in this world that people will point out their own faults in other people. They may not realize they're doing it, but if someone is trying to condemn you about something, chances are it's the fault that they're walking in. <clears throat> and remember, 2 Corinthians 3, 6, Jesus has also made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So restore them in the spirit of meekness. It says, we who are spiritual, restore them in the spirit of meek meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. If you're pointing out their fault instead of pointing out their salvation, if you're pointing out their flesh, their death in the letter of the law, rather than their life in Christ, you are also going to be tempted in that way, and you could fall victim to the same thing they are. So, we've talked about what temptation is, how it comes on us, what it is and what it's not. Remember, temptation is not good. But as with all things, God can use the bad things in this world to help us become better people. We've learned the three ways that temptation comes, through the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. We learned how Jesus defeated those temptations and overcame them, and we've learned how we can do the same thing. So always be aware of temptation. Don't be afraid of it because God has given you the power to overcome it. And be blessed. Stay in the Word. Get your own revelation. Listen to good teachers. Listen to good preachers. And go to the Word. Find out for yourself what the Word says. And stay humble. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your spirit leading us. We thank you for your word guiding us and teaching us. And we thank you for those who are here today and those who will join us online later on. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.